Welcome to Big Blend Radio, where we celebrate variety and how it adds spice to quality of life. Hey, everybody. I'm uh, so excited today to welcome back award-winning author Shelly Armitage. Uh, you can go to her website, ShellyArmitage.com, and she was on our show Ooh, a few years back. I don't know what dates. Don't ask me dates. Um, we're just getting younger by the years, right, Shelly? Um, but she I was wish. on. Yeah, you've written what? This is your ninth book, right? That you've written. I think so. so something ninth or tenth, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, she first, uh, Shelly first came on our show with her book, Walking the Lano. It's a Texas memoir of place, and I love, 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 love this book, and you know that, Shelly. And oh, um, and that. then Shelly's got. A new book out that really kind of goes with walking the lawn. I feel like they should be bookends, huh? <laughs> they should be. Um, they've they've got to be like armchair buddies to read. And the second book out, well, not the second with how um, you know, like I was just saying, she's written eight, nine, ten books. Um, but this is the latest. It's it's a poetry book, and gosh, we just love it when poetry actually gets to be published <laughs> and enjoyed and savored. Um, the book is called A Habit of Landscape, and it is out now. So welcome back, Shelley. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm looking for sunshine today, which we're not having, unfortunately, here in uh, southern New Mexico. But other yeah. than that, I'm doing great. <laughs> well, you need a little rain, I think. Um, you know, oh, we do. I've heard is the southwest needs some water, and where oh, we are... Good in Oregon and we've got a lot of rain so I'll, I'll send you some down I'll say come on, uh, down. you can use it yes absolutely yeah. so bushes like it so yeah, yeah no well it's, it's, it's funny um, about southwesterners we always talk about weather I think that's the the big well uh, topic of conversation <laughs> well there's a lot of wind in the southwest too that's the other part is like the wind you know when you go in fall there's just that wind comes up and you're like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, that's right. The southwest wind. Um, <laughs> other places, if you're getting wind, you might want to really duck. <laughs> you never know what you could be getting with the wind. Unless but, you're migrating um, it's, it's to your back, you know, that would be good. <laughs> Help yeah, the duck, exactly. So. <laughs> give, you, give you a little push. It was funny because we were just driving through Texas and into New Mexico. And I swear to God, as soon as we hit New Mexico, here come the tumbleweeds. And I was like, yeah. that's so cool. I miss the tumbleweeds. You know, I really do. There's something about There's a tumbleweed. Who make, who make uh, Christmas trees out of them. You've probably seen them. They stack them up and make Christmas trees. You know, I keep thinking, oh, what about fires in your house? You know, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. And then you're spray painting. That's probably a little bit of, oh. you know, a little fuel there, too. <laughs> I mean, they're good for you to breathe it, you know, so. Yeah, it's it's amazing. I mean, you come to love the uh, what do you what do you want to call it the with the, the local landscape, which includes tumbleweeds and many other things that most people would say they don't like, but they they have a kind of beauty to them, you know. And the tumbleweeds are magnificent. The sizes sometimes, mm -hmm. and you I want to know where they day. went. <laughs> <laughs> where did they end up? Probably in yeah, China. Where did they start? <laughs> yeah where did they start where did they end you know and well that's what I love about your you know walking the Lano and then also a habit of landscape I think you just you have a very positive outlook on and realistic there's very there's a lot of realism going on in, in your poetry which I think people will appreciate and there's some humor I mean you start off with a little bit of naughty humor with with cattle and um you yeah. know, dry humping is like one of the first there's dry humping in the first poem everybody I mean, <laughs> who knew we were going to talk about that today I didn't mean to but it's funny um but but when you're around animals and you're around nature you those are like things that normally happen like we understand them it's it's just part of course of nature you know and I think you always have this you have this amazing uh skill of observation I know we talked about walking last time you were on the show and you were starting to as well today. And so <laughs> the observation is something I really enjoy about you and, and your writing that you don't take things for granted. Well, thank you. I, I try not to, but of course I, I'm sure I don't appreciate things the way I should, but you know, when you, I, I think of Barry Lopez, you know, and what he talked about with his uh, acreage in, in Oregon that he had been on, you know, for 40 years or something. He said every time he walked into that forest, he saw something different. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah. I think 
I think that's part of what I aim for is, you know, the habit, the habit of landscape, you know, is mm. uh, the habit of witnessing and of, of looking and observing and uh, not exactly reporting what you see, but um, trying to share a moment, a precious moment that passes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and with the Southwest, I think that's an important thing too, because oftentimes people think it's just one big desert and, you know, West Texas, uh, you know, we've talked about West Texas before and <laughs> there's, there's an appreciation that comes with that terrain and you, it's hard for people, maybe the first timers to get that until they really get out of the car. <laughs> well, it's true because, you know, sections of West Texas and the panhandle of Texas are, are, are flat. There's no doubt about it, but, but that's a plateau. That's the, uh, Llano Estacado is it's one of the largest plateaus in North America. And so if you start thinking about it as a plateau, then you know you're on the edge of canyons. <laughs> so, you know, it's not really flat if you see what I'm getting at. And and it, it, it obviously does have a contour anyway, you know, from for altitude. But I do think you, it, I mean, most people, many people pass through those areas driving very fast on the best roads they can find. <laughs> And you never see anything that way. You have to really yeah. stop and walk around, you know. Yeah. So, what led you to write a habit of landscape? I mean, have you always written poetry? Because you, I remember in uh, Walking Lano, there's it's poetic, and you had poetry in there too. Is it well, it's po it's poetic language, I think, and I, I quote some poets. Um, and you know, May Sarton said, "Why, why are there no poets of the plains?" And she's a poet herself, and she was trying to write about mm -hmm. the Santa Fe area because. You know, actually, the plains and the mountains break right up in that area, you know, one into the other. So um, I guess I was trying to ask, answer that question, why are there no poets of the plains? And I, I ended up by saying, well, the plains themselves are poet poetic. So when you walk them, in a way, you take up that, that um, breath and that language, and it, it can come out in your own work, you know, as, mm. as a poet. But to answer your question, I, I mean, I wrote poetry when I was a young person and actually Counting Cattle was written way back in the 1970s. <laughs> you know, I go I go by decades now. So back in the <laughs> 70s, I do that with my students. They look at me like, what, what 70s? They don't, you know, that's beyond. They weren't around. <laughs> <in the 70s. laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, the the way of uh, appreciating um things beyond your youth is to have time to return to them. Mm -hmm. And as an academic for 40 years, I really didn't, I wrote critical studies of things, you know, in books that I'm, I'm happy with. I'm sort of, you know, I'm, I'm glad I did them and I hope that people enjoyed them, but they were not quote unquote creative writing. Mm -hmm. So the minute I, ret I retired, I started working on walking the Yano, even though at that time I didn't know, you know, what it was going to end up being like. Mm -hmm. Um, and many people seem to like that book because it was lyric. And I thought, well, maybe I should try writing some poetry, you mm -hmm. know. And indeed, some of the lines in Walking the Yano, I don't know if I said this previously in our interview back in 2017, I think it was. Was it 2017? I think so. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I used to, I, I would have these lines come to me and I would, I would, you know, write them out on the computer and print them out and post them in my garage so that they would be up on the wall and I could kind of see them all and try to see, well, what is the subconscious relationship here? Oh, you know, that's neat. and uh, they really were poetic lines. Mm -hmm. So in this book, A Habit of Landscape, I, I kind of, you know, tried to take on the form of poetry in terms of a holding place for these kind of lyric lines, these sort of, I don't know, songs of the Yano that I wanted to write. And mm. it was a challenge because I'm not trained in poetry. I mean, I, I you know, a uh, little learning is a dangerous thing. I have taught classes in poetry, but that doesn't mean I know how to write it. <laughs> I loved it because you did so many different styles too. You let what the words take flow as they need to be. Um, you also did things, you know, side poems and um i think that was was it the cedar waxwing one where you have a whole side poem going on at the same yeah. time and yeah and then even just the, the the play of being able to move words around on a page so that they can flow like a river you know it's like here you know so they have these textures added textures to it and 
I think, you know, that's it's something we forget about poetry and, and it's about sitting, catching the rhythm. That's the thing to me of poetry is it catching yeah. that rhythm, right? And so mm -hmm. I, I think you did that very well. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad it worked worked for you. You know, some people might say, "Why is she scattering those words all over the page?" Because that's but what I, the landscape does. That's yeah. the tumbleweed effect. Here we go. And actually, <laughs> I've written a poem. Not in it's not in this book, but it's on on the Ano Estacado, and I really used a lot of spacing and a lot of um, uh, you know design elements in the way I use the language on the page in trying to capture the Ano. That, that that plateau that I just mentioned earlier, yeah. yeah. So for that, I, I like for that. The landscape. Yeah, the landscape feel is to bring it in, have mm -hmm. those textures in there. So yeah. would you say I'm right about the two books going together as like a set? Absolutely, thank you for saying that. Yes, I think they do. And in fact, the, the term a habit of landscape occurs in Walking the Ano. In other words, I took that that term yeah. out of the previous book and, and shaped a whole book around it. And of course, I, I went to the dictionary and looked up the etymology of, of habit and habitat. And guess what? They share root words that mean to hold uh, or to dwell. Mm. So back to the Barry Lopez uh, remark I made earlier, you know, kind of when you return to a landscape over and over again, you are dwelling in it. You know, you're really mm -hmm. living in it and you're holding it in a mm -hmm. way. And I think these poems are holders of, yeah. of ideas, but of experiences and things like that. Well, it's, it's kind of like showing the ecosystem of, of through the years, because you hold history in your poetry of what is, what has shaped the land, right? And so, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's cattle or, you know, birds or, you know, but then you bring in the Native American culture. So you, you're bringing in that, um, where humans and nature coexist or don't, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 exactly. And I mean, in a poem like Removal, which has to do with the great, great grandmother um, who was Cherokee. And I hate to say that because, you know, that, that sounds like appropriation and uh, all that. I don't mean it in any way like that, but this is a story really about my mother and, and her mother and her mother's mother and uh, the kind of traditions they pass down and things like that. And in that poem, it, um, it, it it's kind of, there's a, there's a turn at the end. In many of my poems, there are turns at the end that you're not expecting. And I say, I think something like, even though I'm adopted, I long to hear the whisper in the blood. Mm. And sometimes those last lines like that have come to me and I thought, what goes before them, you know? Right, but you, yeah. you do refer to blood in one of the poems. Is it the one with the cattle at the beginning? You talk about the blood going through to, you know, as a birth. Like, yeah, I think it is the first poem uh, with the cattle where you talk about, you know, your grandfather, oh, the blood your father. The daughter. Yes. Yeah, uh -huh. and so it that's where it becomes, like when I talk about realism, like you're, Yet at the same time, it's like it, your realism, but then you're you're painting these textures, and you're like a you know a painter with words. And so when you're talking about that, it's like whoa, okay, that's like real. <laughs> Yet at the same time, it's metaphoric and and textured and beautiful. It it's really interesting how you do that, and I think, you know, it. I hope inspires people that read it to, kind of, go back to the importance of words and the beauty and the art of just a word of how it can be used in so many different ways and meanings. Like the word blood is something that can be done just, I mean, there's a myriad ways of artistically using that word. Absolutely. And you know, that, that poem uh, in vitro bandstand, it's actually about blood too, because I mean, I was an Ill illegitimate <laughs> child, if you want to use that term. My, my mother was not married and she was abandoned really by her, her lover. And so the baby is in the, in the belly while my mother is dancing to these songs out of the 1940s, you know? And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's that kind of feeling of the blood uh, that, that exists between the mother and the baby. And of course the, ba the in vitro bandstand is the baby with the Bose like headphones of the belly button you know, hearing all these songs. And I mean, that is actually true. I, I know mm -hmm. these songs and some of the second uh, stanzas. How? I mean, yeah. it's just weird. It's a beautiful and, era of music. 
that the forties, I mean, I think was just an amazing decade of music. Really. Absolutely. Yeah. So I use those song titles, you know, a lot in that poem to, uh, and, and it, it makes me cry to think about it because the, the last line is something about my sweet embraceable you, mm. you know, See. so it's the baby loving the mother and, and worrying about what the mother went through in order to have this baby by herself, you know, especially then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. been, well, oh, now it's so hard. To, well, let's not go there now. <laughs> Well, yeah, right. That's yeah. a loaded thing, yeah. Yeah, but history's I, kind of on a circle, isn't it? And that's the thing, too, when you look at land, is you see those cycles of repetition, right, and, and change at the same time. Yes, nature. absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, in Walking the Auto, there's a reference to um, a wild rose that's growing on the edge of one of the canyon walls. Mm -hmm. We walk past that, and when we come back from our hike, that uh, canyon wall has started crumbling. And that rose is hanging off. I mean, the change just happens all the time, you know, mm -hmm. in, in geology. I remember that. I remember that part distinctly. Like, yeah. As soon as you said that, I, I remember that part of the book. And yeah. of course, I use that to try to resonate with the idea of the turbines coming and the fact that mm -hmm. there's always change in the landscape. And maybe you don't approve of it or embrace it. But the whole idea of living fully is to embrace change. There's no way yeah. around it. No. That's the big, but that's the biggest fear factor, I think, other than public speaking, <laughs> is, is embracing change. That's humans, you know, because we have to leave our comfort zone and and under can we handle whatever is going to be dealt? You know, can do we have the strength? Do we have the, you know, the wit, the the quick mindedness for what's going to happen and change? And and we panic Absolutely. about that. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And I mean, as as someone who's trying to be a poet, I, I put myself kind of at the bottom of the barrel there saying, you know, I resist. I resist change, you know, <laughs> but then I'm trying to not exactly celebrate it, but present it, you know, bring it forward in these poems and, and, mm -hmm. and in, in Walking the Yano, too, you know. What about I like what you say about the lines being realistic, but also metaphoric, because mm -hmm. they're, it's a little bit like the imagist poets who, you know, used an image, but below that image was a resonance of ideas mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of um, connections. Mm -hmm. And I, I strive for that. I really do to try to be suggestive. You know, it's not, um, not, not yeah. altogether connotative, but denotative, you know, kind of. Lines well, allows the reader to co-create. I hope and so. You have to have that breathing yeah. space for people to be part of the experience. You know, mm. the poetry shouldn't be telling you what to do. It should be right, right. Something where, like, like, yeah, when you look at a mm. painting, everyone sees something different. Same with music, and that that's where I wanted to go with you on this with rhythm, because there's a rhythm of the landscape, like we we're talking about rep repetition and change, right? That's a rhythm. Um, that's music in a way, right? The way the landscape is, there's music all through the landscape. I know you've written about music as well. I, I know we talked about music before, um, <laughs> but in poetry, you know, it's lyrical, but there's, you know, obviously, but um, do you feel like music influences how you write the rhythms and, you know, maybe the rhythm of like a heartbeat changes, you know, like the pace of a poem can change according to the characters to what you're writing about, you know, something and blowing in the wind, you know, is going to be a little bit different than, <laughs> oh my gosh, you know, a bull getting castrated. <laughs> We're back to dry humping and castration today. Sorry, folks. <laughs> I'm looking behind you to see if anything's walking by and wants to run away. <laughs> I know, right? I know. Yeah. Well, well, we're taking care of a female dog and she's like, uh, -uh none of that's happening here. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think the rhythm of a poem, you know, as it is read, both the way the, the writer hears it, you know, but also the way the readers maybe take it up and hear it themselves, which could be different, of course, um, is, is the key to poetry. They always say the key to poetry is the line. And, and yes, it's the line where you break it, you know, and, and actually the rhythm of the line, but it's the overall rhythm, too, of of how ideas or experiences or um, I don't know what else you would call it. Uh, anyway, impulses would come to you through through a piece of writing like poetry. Mm -hmm. So and in our world where 
words are cheap, it seems, you know what I mean? In terms of repetition of things we hear all the time on the news cycles and, mm -hmm. you know, people talk so rapidly and I think, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's no respect for the language, you know, there's no mm -hmm. honoring of the language. And not that they could, I mean, we'd be there all night long with the nightly report if we, you know, <laughs> hovered over every word. But there is a preciousness to language and, and language, as we know, can be very hurtful. It can be, it, it can colonize. I mean, um, she unnames them, the last poem, I mean, the mm -hmm. next to the last poem in the collection is really about how when we name anything, we we colonize it, we control it, you know, we we own it. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's that poem you're trying to strip the, the names off till you get to the very basic mm -hmm. entity or the very quality of life itself, maybe. So that's interesting when you think about that, because when you talk about change, you know, when we weren't so civilized like a society or, you know, back in our caveman days, it was about food and survival, right? It was survival, you know, fight or flight or hesitate and run, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. But now I feel like the fear is almost these fears we have in society is because we're societal and we've created this civilization. Like we've created um, societal norms and this is how you're supposed to be. And so when you look at that, that's where our fears are. Are our fears really real? Are they survival fears or are they just this facade? Because that's what we've created as a, as a civilization. Other than are they, food and, and are farming. They an easy way around making decisions? Are they an easy way, you know, to let someone make the decisions for you, i.e. society oh. and society's mores or something? Yeah. It's interesting when you, and that's what I think poetry makes you ponder and think and, you know, kind of go, hey, there's different ways. And the other thing, like with music, there's always like, here's the bridge, here's, you know, the chorus, there's the certain structure that has to loop around. Whereas poetry, you can turn around and go, just when you thought you were comfortable, I'm taking you down this road here. <laughs> so there's a freedom to poetry as that you have to embrace. Otherwise, if it's the poem is too tight, there's no breathing, there's no time to ponder so there's a freedom to it I think I'm glad you're saying all these things because in my readings I've had so far and in what I anticipated as an old college professor would come up is like oh I don't like poetry I don't know how to read it I don't you know all this kind of stuff and I think just read it and listen to it just listen to the words you don't have to worry about whether you know anything about poetry or not because language by its very nature is poetic you know mm -hmm. so um you know, I, I, I'm I'm sad that people are so afraid of poetry. And I think this book, frankly, is not going to be as popular as Walking the Yano because what? People don't think it's a story. They don't think it's a narrative. But every single poem has a tiny narrative in it. They're all stories. Mm. It's figurative. Um, there's an artist we love, uh, Victoria Chick, and she's based out in Silver City, New Mexico. And uh, she's a contemporary figurative artist. And she basically paints those moments, those side moments of in between something happening. So like if a cat's going to jump, she captures the painting is going to be of the cat as it's about to jump. You know, there's that split second. Mm -hmm. And it's just these little pauses in life, movements and pauses, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's, it, I feel that with your art. And what, when I say art, I mean poetry or the written craft, the art of it. Mm -hmm you've these stories there's a narrative like you're saying but it's these little moments of you know what goes through someone's head when something is happening these little moments that often just get brushed aside in life you know hey we're Absolutely. so busy yeah. you know, these moments are actually what make us as a human being as an individual it's the matrix yeah oh boy I know, man, we're getting all warped here. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's that's why spacing in on a page of poetry, you know, it's a white page. There's a poem in here. I forgot what I even entitled it, but um, it has to do with the, the blank page being like the plains. And, you know, in the poem, the, the antelope materialize, but they break through the poem. They break through so that uh, they are words in a poem. Mm. So it's really about white space. You know, the white space on the page, and now there's all these footprints on it. You know, there's all these things that have come about 
uh, and with those pauses, you know, and that what, the white space ideas that we know in art, you know, in painting, mm -hmm. that's, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah. Even design. Yeah. I mean, even it's just the space. So, uh, yeah. yeah. But that's Sorry. a way of accomplishing what you're talking about with the, the honoring the pauses and mm -hmm. honoring the spaces in between. I love that idea of yours. That that's that is what I've tried to do. Exactly. So are you going to read a poem for us? Yeah, sure. I'd, I'd like to do that. Um, I thought I'd read a, a poem called Antelope and I because it's kind of canonical in the book in that um, many poems deal with encounters with nature, encounters with critters, and, you know, and so forth. But uh, and some there's some poems where, uh, heaven forbid, I let the animals speak for themselves, oh. which I've been told is a no-no. You know, you're not that again, that's appropriation in a way, but I do it in a kind of playful way. Um, and part of what I'm, I think what I'm trying to get at in many of these poems, as in Antelope and I, is kinship. The idea of realizing the mm -hmm. kinship that we are a part of nature, not not separate from it, that we are exactly. nature itself. Yeah. So anyway, this is called Antelope and I. I, I mean, <laughs> You see me, of course, before I see you. But then as I walk a sage-fringed trail, up the draw and down, something, a shared animal presence, makes me look west, see you. Even at 75 yards, your bold white chest, radiant exception to the plains gone done, cures my nearsightedness. You, on the other hand, can spot movement, at three miles away. Pronghorn, Guajada, Antilocapra, Americana, neither antelope nor deer, your closest living cousin, the giraffe. Ancestry assures you persist with hollowed hairs, your antifreeze for winter, camouflage coat, butterscotch stripes and all. Side set eyes catch whirls in their orbs, Long lashes like sunshades, nervous, curious, your Pleistocene genes still bolt, then stand. Now this is fossil fuel. At speeds of 50 miles an hour, your ancient bloodline remembers ghosts of grasslands, chaparral, cacti. You disappear, sliding un under on your knees, mocking the wisdom of barbed wire. But I am exotic, am I not? My old checkered farm coat, sagging leaves, sleeves, sorry, baggy warm ups, a whiff of acrid humanness, the unwashed best tolerated upwind. I am held at a distance by your gaze. We used to talk to animals, or was it animals talk to us? Mm. Until evolutionary changes in the trachea made one claim superiority over the other. But if you were the carnivore, I would offer myself up, even as you did to the old Sunni, line to the heart, prayer over horns. Instead, I can only say in a stillness beyond thought, I would be the grass before you. I love that. I love that. And I love that you bring up the pronghorn being related to giraffe. <laughs> that's but thing. there's some lovely metaphors in there and that communication with animals to me is so crucial because I do believe we communicate with animals you know yes and I think they communicate with us or they try mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know John Berger has a really interesting essay I don't know that I can remember the name. I think it's um, looking at animals something like that and he's taking zoos to task because they are places where we objectify animals you know we look mm -hmm. at them all the time maybe and they it's don't not want their habitat to that's not their natural right. habitat you're not really watching animal behavior in in reality you know they're not right. they're not I, I hate zoos with that part i like what they're doing in regards to rehabilitation and and some portions of it is real you know education so i know i'm going to get in trouble with the zoo comment but <laughs> um i think you know there are some good programs with them so i shouldn't just blatantly say all that but mm -hmm. really you're not watching an animal in its real habitat 
So you're not getting the true story. It's not real. Well, I mean, they're they're in cages, no matter how large the cage is, even if it's a little savanna, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not normal. It's not natural. And you know, you do wonder what they see back. Yeah. Know? Why are a bunch and, of people doing this? Why are they staring at me? And then you have people that try to get in the cage with them. I know. Oh my goodness. I know. It's 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 crazy. It's absolutely you know, crazy. Berger develops this whole argument about um how our culture or our society, you know, uses animals, you know, how we use them, the slaughterhouse mm -hmm. on up or down, and, uh, and continue to objectify them so that they're not really, in other words, we're not kin. Mm -mm. We're not killing one of our own, we're killing something else. Ah, and that's maybe killing them with our, our view of them, you know, our, our way we'd name them and describe them and own them and I mean, there's what's the alternative, you know, is would be the question. But still, he's got an interesting point, I think. Well, yeah, but the, in, in naming them, we it's like in a way closeness, but it's like I own a dog. I own a cat mentality versus, you know, their family. My, you know? my, my. Yeah. My, 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 said the spider to the fly. <laughs> you know, there's there's a woman here called Trace, if I can find it, which um, is kind of playful, but has to do with this kinship thing we're talking about. And, you know, realizing the kinship. You want me to read it? or Sure, sure. Yeah, it's absolutely. It's not as long as the oh, other sure. one. It's called Trace. T-R-A-C-E. Trace. Mm -hmm. With a curve of the tail, ermine lifted. He reigned over a kingdom bereft of rats. It was 1935. Your Sunday comics humor and upright droll. With your assistance themselves two pussycats, but smaller, carrying your uplifted train. The profession procession was a striped delight, the pussycat princes. Why do I think of you when I see the local road, road runner tack to and fro on the desert roads? It's the tail, a ballast, a rudder, balance a throwback to the dinosaurs. My own showed up on the x-ray, a tiny coccyx crack from a fall healed over to aid yet another bump to what was once a tail. Vestigial, they called it, a useless footprint, a trace. But it caused chronic arthritis, an evolutionary ache, restored a sensate memory of equilibrium, animal to animal, of how kin we are, in our fur and boots. I love that. I love that. <laughs> and I like that. The evolutionary oh, yeah. ache. That's, you know, that's, that is brilliant. I like that. That's, that's brilliant. It's true too. I mean, what's going to happen? Our, our pinkies and our little toes are going to start aching. <laughs> you know, they're going to fall off one day. And, yeah, you know, right. you know, it's, it's interesting how we have these are, now our thumbs are going to get bigger to be on phones. I don't know. Are we, you know, it's interesting how we went from being little teeny people to giants, you know. I know. I know. We're no longer Lilliputians now. No, we are, no we are the jolly green giant. But then we were saying, we were talking about this the other day, that people who live on islands are smaller a lot of the times, you know, because their island is smaller space. So it's kind of, mm -hmm. it's interesting how we, go with the land that we're from but now we're all over the all over the place we're all over the world we're all over you know we're well, spread I think, out I think, so i wonder you know, about, about knowing our, hmm? you know some of it's diet i think you know that we overeat and we mm -hmm. we you know for decades we've eaten uh more than maybe we should or i mean we're not exactly out gathering uh seeds you know to eat through the winter time so that's part of it i think yeah. Well, but then being spread out and not knowing our roots, you know, it's like how many people leave their small town and go home later? You know, they always, <laughs> you know, life was nice and simple back there. I think I'll go back. You know? Well, you know, that's why I've kept my little farmhouse in Vega, Texas. It it mm -hmm. was, uh, it, was, it was truly a little house on the prairie. I mean, a guy who lived in a dugout south of town built it in 1920. Wow. And it's hand built. I mean, it, it's just That's a treasure. Special. I go to that house and when I walk in, I can smell the spicy smell of the cedars, shiver robes that are still in the house. 
And I always say, this sounds so corny, but I always say to the house, oh, thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. You know, because it's such a, a sweet shelter. Mm-hmm. And my point I, I, I was trying to make and probably didn't make very well is that it, it's simple. There's no mm-hmm. TV. There's no uh, dishwasher. Uh, there's barely a stove <laughs> and a small refrigerator. But And there's a clawfoot bathtub <laughs> that has a ring in it. <laughs> Sounds like a good place to write. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. Although I've done most of the writing these last two books in a garage because I didn't <laughs> have a study. <laughs> oh, well, well, you know, you got to do what you got to do, you know, <laughs> but I'm so glad you came back. I want everyone to know, go to ShellyArmitage.com. That is the website and it's a habit of landscape. Go get it. It is beautiful. I appreciate you being back on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's such a delight. And I also, oh, I got to give a shout out to our sponsor and you should know about them. And if okay. you don't know already, that's very cool. And I think you should do this. Uh, is the National Parks Arts Foundation. There are just one of our favorite nonprofits. They uh, create artist residencies in parks across America. Hawaii mm-hmm. volcanoes, you could go and stay in this beautiful house overlooking the ocean. And you spend a month as an artist, whether you're a writer, a poet, a musician, a painter. That's what these residencies are for. And there's one up in Chaco, um, up in northern New Mexico for oh, Indian. Nice. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying, uh, dry tortugas okay. up on the Florida Keys. So everyone, nationalparksartsfoundation.org. We do our first Friday show with them every month. So tune in for that. But I had to give them a shout out. And I think you should apply for one. Well, I think you. it'd be cool. I, I would like to. I would love to do that. Wouldn't I think Chaco would be interesting for you? Chaco would be do. fantastic. I love petroglyphs. And I, you know, I deeply, I mean, you can see the two Gray Hills rug behind yeah. me. I, into it <laughs> yeah you got to do chocolate and fort union too i mean it's just in fort union has amazing history you know and i think it, it all connects back Selden, so. you know they've, they've recently honored the you know the roundup that occurred there with native americans and mm. have a new you know interpretive center and things for yeah yeah fort Selden. so um wow yeah all these are great places and i you know i think it's important to go and just be in them to, that's to, the beauty of this like residency mm-hmm. yeah you're there for a month so you're not just doing a drive through you're there for an entire month to soak it all up that's fantastic you know? so, I didn't um, know about that. i'll look into it i really will yeah I'm, i'll okay. send you the link everyone national parks arts foundation.org check it out okay. thanks so much shelly thank you have a great day you too thank you for listening to big blend radio keep up with our shows at bigblendradio.com